Hello and welcome to the sixth Time for a Pint virtual get-together. Uh, I am Chris Mann and I'm joined by my co-host Matt. Hello Matt. Hiya. Would you like to introduce one of our guests? I would. Um, so I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Jonathan Hills. Um, he's a director of clocks um, at Sotheby's in London. Um, he's a member of the Antiquarian Horological Society, which I think is possibly where I first met him. Um, he's the previous master of the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers. Um, until January this year, and uh, a regular at Time for a Point. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Matt. Good welcome evening, everybody. Along. Thank Good you. Evening. Uh, and I have the great pleasure of introducing Seth Kennedy, who some of you may have met slash heard before on, I think, episode 41 of the Time for a Point podcast, where he came and sat down with me and um, explained English pocket watches to me and then answered many of my stupid questions. Um, and that, that kind of sums up our relationship. I ask him stupid questions. He's very kind and answers them. And then we have a nice time and talk about watches. Um, Seth is a uh, watchmaker, an antiquarian horologist, a case maker and a quest scholar. Welcome along, Seth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Nice to be here. Fantastic. So for anybody who's not been before and those that have but can't remember, the format that we, we stick to is each of us has brought along a watch. Um, we are going to take turns talking about those watches. We will explain what they are, how they work, what they do, why we like them, where they came from. And we'll take questions from other, other members of the panel because the other three of us might have a question about the watch that the person is talking about. And also from everybody uh, listening and watching from home. Don't forget, please use the Q&A function if you have a question that you would like to ask. So I'm going to share my screen now and you should see pictures of watches, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Okay, can everybody see that? Can all the panelists see that? Can everyone in the chat see that? Good, great. Uh, so first up, Jonathan, handing over to you. Tell me when you'd like me to skip slides. Wonderful, thanks very much, um, Chris. And uh, yeah, let's uh, have a look at the, the next slide, please. Um, uh, I thought we'd, well, I thought I'd bring along a novelty watch, quite frankly, um, something that um, was uh, made for a purpose, but never really became, never really went into use. So the post office watch or telegraph watch. Um, and can we look, have a look at the next slide so we can actually have a, a close up of the dial? Um, an unusual layout, or, or not layout, but an unusual uh, markings, uh, because this watch was designed uh, to be able so that uh, to make it easier to send the time by Morse code. Um, you know, why would you need to do that? Well, days of the telegraph, um, sending the time by Morse code uh, involved sending out the numerals, and they're only the numerals one to nine and zero. Uh, and each of those in Morse code takes five dots or dashes. Uh, and so the idea of this watch was to, sell, to, to be able to send the time more quickly by using letters rather than numbers. Um, you can see the layout of the dial. I think if we go on to the next slide, Chris, we can actually see this is the principle of it uh, in that uh, the, the hours, one to 12, are marked up A to M. Uh, and so if it's one o'clock, it you just send the letter A. Uh, but also the letters A to M denote the numerals, uh, the, the five, 10, 15, 20 minutes. So quarter past one would be AC um, and, and onwards. So uh, 6.30 FF. No 24 hour clock, so you're just one to 12. Um, and then you've got the problem of the minutes. And so the minutes at each, the intermediate minutes are R, S, W, X. Uh, so for instance, uh, 22 minutes past one would be A, D, S. Rather than having to send 22 minutes past one would be 1, 22, you'd have to send one and two and two. 15, um, and you can see at the bottom here, uh, the time five hours, 52 minutes, EKS. So that's the, that's the general idea. Um, how did this watch come about? If we can go to the next slide. Uh, here's the, the movement of the watch, and it's signed JF Hills, 
post office, Sudbury, Suffolk. So J.F. Hills is Joseph Francis Hills. He was born in 1930, sorry, he was born in 1833. Uh, and he is my, now let me just get this right, he's my great, great grandfather's brother. Um, they were watchmakers together uh, in Sudbury, Suffolk. But Joseph was not only a watchmaker, but he was also, also the postmaster. And this put him in a unique position of needing to send the time by Morse code and realizing that it was a bit of a pain and could he come up with a better idea? So he came up with the idea of this watch. Uh, if we can go to the next slide first, please. So here he is, Joseph Francis Hills um, in later life. And um, he, uh, well, I'm not gonna say too much about him. If you want to know a lot more about him, you need to come to the Antiquarian Horological Society lecture uh, in November, the London lecture in November, when I'll be talking about both, um, both he, him and his brother in a lot more detail. But um, here's a photograph of him, and if we look at the next slide, we'll find out a little bit more. Um, he basically invented this watch, and he exhibited it in 1885 um, at the International Inventions Exhibition in South Ken. And here is uh, one of the uh, horology write-ups in the engineer from October that year and at the bottom Mr J F Hills of the post office in Sudbury Suffolk exhibits a novelty of his own invention in the shape of a watch with a specially designed dial showing the code letters for the use of postmasters and telegraphists by whom it will doubtless be largely adopted he hoped. Uh, Mr Hills is to be congratulated in being the first to conceive an idea, the obvious utility and simplicity of which renders it difficult to believe that it ever occurred to anyone before. So uh, he came up with this watch um, and exhibited one of them at the, the exhibition in 1885. If we go to the next slide, Chris, um, very luckily in my family, um, we found this little book, uh, The Post Office and Telegraph Watch. Uh, in his writing, and if we can go to the next slide, thankfully inside it, he's laid out basically what it costs to set up. Um, having having come up with the idea, he then uh, had to have all the uh, all the ancillaries, and so this list, starting in November, uh, 1884, um, he's ordering blocks so that he can have pictures of the watch printed. He's ordering watch cases. Um, three watch cases at, at two shillings each um, and then he gets a whole load more when he realizes he's quite happy with them further a little, little bit further down on the 4th of December he orders three dozen watch cases so he's, um, he's obviously getting optimistic about how well these things are going to do and how popular they're going to be um, he also lists here engraving um, or, or uh, supply of 500 envelopes printed and stamped uh, so that he can um, send out details to all the postmasters in the country and hoping that they're all going to buy a watch. And then wonderfully, seven watches he orders on the 14th of November at 68 shillings each. That's, uh, what is that, three pounds 40 each uh, from a Lock & Co in Birmingham. Uh, and uh, he's obviously really getting keen now because on the 11th of December, he orders another five watches from William Lock um, at the same price. So his outlay there, and I did tot it up, £49, pounds, 15 shillings, 7 pence halfpenny, um, in um, basically preparing uh, the watches and hoping that he's going to uh, send a few out. You can also see here postage of circulars and a watch to Mr Whitfield. And Mr Whitfield, he'd engaged as a sort of roving, he was a travelling salesman, and hoping that he was going to show this watch off um, around the country. Um, receipts, a little bit difficult to see, but um, he was charging five guineas a watch. Um, and uh, by 1884, the very first watch, he actually sold not to a postmaster, but to uh, somebody local that he knew. Um, then one, one, went, one went off to Yorkshire, another one off to Manchester, and another one off to Yeldham in Essex. Um, and uh, at uh, five, uh, five pounds, five shillings a guinea each, um, but he wasn't able to retire on it, then. Not at that point, no, no, <laughs> not at that point. <laughs> um, so the you know, return was a little bit on the slow side. Um, hence, I think the, you know, getting it into the exhibition, I'm hoping that would um, trigger interest. 
Um, if we can look at the next page, Chris, please. So luckily we found one of the, the envelopes that he'd had printed. Um, and uh, so very proudly, Post Office and Telegraph watch manufactured and patented by J.F. Hills. Well, that's, um, we hear about all these sort of things today, don't we, about people saying that they're, they're making everything. Um, he clearly didn't manufacture it, um, but he, he, and whether he patented it or not, not really quite sure. Um, it says trademark on the dial, but I've, I've not actually looked into quite how, um, um, how far he went with that. And the next page, Chris, please. Uh, but here's the box. So two shillings each, these box costs. This is the box that this particular watch comes in. Um, the post office and telegraph watch manufactured and sold by J.F. Hill's postmaster. Um, very proudly. Um, so how, much is, how much is five guineas in today's money? Uh, five pounds, five, five pounds, 25 pence. Uh, plus 140 years worth of inflation, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, I'll, yeah, I'll go so, on if there's a calculator minute on it. The, so, um, a box and papers for a 19th century watch. A um, bit on the unusual side. Um, can we go look at the next slide first, please? So, going back to the watch itself, um, the case, hall marked, um, and the next slide actually. Going a bit closer. So, hall marked for Birmingham, 1884. Um, so they were brand new. Uh, the serial number 23816. Uh, the English Watch Company. Um, don't know how many people are, are, uh, are well up on the English Watch Company, but one of the very earliest maths manufacturers in this country of, of watches um, in Birmingham, uh, saying, you know, the English Watch Company sounds fantastic, but it, actually, if you look into David Butcher, has, it, lot of, must, most of you must know David Butcher and the vintage watch straps. Um, he does a lot on trench watches. He's got a very, very good blog. And he, if you want to look into detail at the English Watch Company and its origins, he's got a very good blog on that. Um, if you go to vintage watch straps, I think, dot, I'm not sure whether it's dot org or dot com. Um, but uh, he gives a, a, a lot of detail about that. And in fact, it was a, an American company uh, using an American equip, equipment. Uh, the Anglo-American Watch Company set up in Birmingham in the 1860s, I believe. Uh, they were using, they were, they were selling them as English watches using American equipment to make plates and barrels and everything else came from Switzerland. But they were sold as English watches, of course. Um, and that, that firm went bust uh, and it became, it was taken over, became the English Watch Company. Um, and uh, I think they lasted for 20 years uh, and went bust in, in 1894, I think 1894, 1895. Um, but they were, they were basically trying to compete with both America and Switzerland. Um, and in fact, we can't go back to it, but the slide that was listing in the engineers exhibition above the bit about Joseph's um, post office watch was a wonderful piece uh, about the English Watch Company and how they were um, make, manufacturing fantastic English watches as competition for the Swiss. Well, in fact, they were using mostly Swiss parts for them. Uh, so, a bit of fun. RB at the bottom was Robert Bragg. Um, he's a sponsor's mark and he was the, uh, the owner of the company. He took over from his father in 1883 and this watch being 1884. Uh, look up the next slide, please. Here, later on in the book, uh, is the complete list of all 12 watches. So he ordered the, the first seven and then added another five. Um, he had his own private numbering, as you can see on the left hand side, and then the number of the watch. Uh, and all of these watches, first one to Mr. Whitfield was a sample, um, and then he sold the next few. Uh, and then we come down to this watch, 23816. Um, which has got various crossings out because it was sold to Mr. Gardner at Yeldham and then returned as faulty. Um, and Mr. Gardner of Yeldham was given another watch, um, which had already been returned. So they weren't, they weren't great. They were sent on APRO. You can see on the second page the dates that these were all sent on APRO. Um, and I think two remained sold, two were returned, obviously um, not very successful. Um, <laughs> 
and uh, so it was not the greatest of commercial successes. Uh, he, um, having having got twelve, he sold. In fact, I did make a note. I had a quick add up. Um, Forty nine pounds fifteen shillings seven pence halfpenny was the set up costs. Um, initially, he sold twenty pounds fifteen shillings worth, and in total, um, he sold forty one pounds worth. So he was eight pounds down the pan on the whole exercise. Um, so like the only what we ideas. have left. Sorry. It sounds like one of my business ideas. <laughs> I, I did a quick, I did a quick Google to find out how much five pounds and five shillings might be, and it's over six hundred and fifty quid. So it's it's a decent whack, isn't it? There you go, there you go. Yeah, no, it was it was you know he clearly he was. But that would suggest that he's lost the best part of three grand or something in the enterprise as yeah. well. So yeah, yeah exactly. were they, do you know um do you know whether they were more um more expensive than a normal watch? If you bought an English watch company watch, um, I don't know what. Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't looked up to see yeah, see what I'm the. Sure I, mean, I mean, obviously the dial was a special order, um, but the rest of it was pretty straightforward. So um, presumably, lot, lots were buying from the English watch company and then supplying him. Um, don't know. Um, but he might but have I, been I, should, to... I should imagine it's fairly similar. I, I met, he might have been trying to charge a little more for his idea, perhaps. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, the, the, the cost of the watch was what three pounds, three pounds twenty, three pounds yeah. forty, and he was charging five twenty-five. So he wasn't, um, he wasn't excessively, wasn't going up. Wasn't bearing in mind the rest yeah. of the, you know, the case and everything else. Um, exactly. Compared to much today's it, really. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, no there point. Um, and there we are. So, um, not a great commercial success, but a rare watch. I'd love to hear from anybody if they've got one. Um, he was actually, the idea was ripped off by Marconi's after 1900, uh, when they actually started making um, some nickel plated ones with Swiss movements. And they put a 24 hour dial on. So they used exactly the same dial as him, but they did go round. And I've got, I actually got one of those as well. Um, they went um, N to Z. Um, for the 24 hour dial, so um, they ripped off the idea, and I don't think those were a great success either. Uh, so I'd uh, love to hear from have love to hear from anyone who's got another one of the 12, because um, it would be great to find out what happened to them. And if we just see the last slide, and there he is um, in later life, and there's his watch. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, any questions? From the from the audience, any more questions from the panel? So Start in silence. <laughs> <laughs> the usual wa pocket watch kiss of death. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, I mean, it is fascinating. I, I love that the, the 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 journalist covering the the exhibition was like, "This is sure to be a huge success." I can't believe no one's thought of this before, and not only. Did he only make twelve? But he didn't quite manage to sell all twelve of them. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. He sold he sold eight of the twelve. Two went two went to some, uh, yeah. Of the twelve, eight were sold. Uh, two went to samples. We've got this one, and uh, the the other one we've got no idea what happened to. There's no no record of it at all. It's one of those um, awkward ideas where you need the other person to have one as well, or you you know. You, you need it at both ends to some extent for the person to be able to yeah. decode what you've just sent them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, fascinating. Oh. Um, I, I mean, wh whoever it was that said they were going to be looking for the watches we were talking about on eBay, I wish you the very eBay. best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> but, as, but, but as Jonathan said, if, if anyone does have any more information, it'd be fantastic if they could get in touch with Jonathan. Um, he is on Instagram as J. Hills. I think I've put that in the um, in the notes already. But but um, also the email, obviously, um, uh, available at Sotheby's. Um, a couple of questions have come in. Um, one from Hervé asking whether the idea had been applied in other uh, in other countries. So was the patent just in the UK or or was it global? Well, I I, I have my doubts as to whether it was actually patented. Right. Um, 
uh, although he says patent. I, 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 have, I admit I've never looked into it, but... Um, okay. Well, maybe something for okay. November. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, absolutely, yeah, more research to do, absolutely. Dr. James Nye, who uh, has joined surreptitiously, said he's very much looking forward to the November lecture, I'm sure he is. Um, good, good, good. And uh, James said it's ahead of his time, pun intended. So that's probably that's probably it. For, for anybody that's not been to an AHS lecture and isn't aware of James Nye, can I just say now that those are the level of puns you can expect from the man in person. So if you enjoy horology and puns, you should sign up to the AHS immediately and get along to a London lecture. Is that enough? Actually, that was, a, Is that, that was okay? a different James. That was a oh. different James. <sighs> multiple Jameses, multiple puns. Might be a James. They're not a don't know. Not only are we insulting guests, we're insulting our uh, audience as well. So, right on that note, <laughs> that's what they come here for, Matt. That's what the, that's what we're all here for. Um, should, should we go to the next watch, Seth? I think it okay. might be your turn. Okay. Um, right. Well, I'll try and uh, I've got some notes. I shall try and work through and uh, describe this, which was you know when Chris invited me on, I sort of thought about what I had um, uh, of my own that I could uh, that I could show. Um, and decided to go for age really rather than complexity so this is something that's got a bit of age to it um, as a rule I've got a bit a bit of an affinity to London watches um, just because I am a Londoner and in fact three of my grandparents were born in the city as well so I've got quite a long family history here and of course London was such an important place uh, for watchmaking for, for so long um, and I also quite like watches that tend to be uh, have some connection to the maker rather than just being a retailer's name. Um, and this one, Barold, there's certainly a, a combination of the two. Um, so if you move on to the next slide, then Chris. Uh, so this is a Hunter watch, um, as in it has a full cover over the dial. Um, as a style of watch case, this came in around 1800, you get some that are sort of a bit earlier than that, but it became quite fashionable in uh, English watches in particular. Um, the, just to describe this particular watch, the, uh, it was engine turned on the, on the front and probably the back as well, but that's faded, you probably can't see it in this image, but the, it's sort of, it was quite a well used watch, um, so the, the case has worn a fair amount. Um, the central bit sort of little raised dimple you can see helps really distinguish the front from the back because otherwise it would be quite difficult to know which way around you were holding it when you wanted to open the front um, to uh, to see the time. Um, there's a little push button on top of the pendant that you'd push as with a normal hunter in order to um, uh, in order to, to spring the front open so if you move on to the next one um, uh, there it is so uh, it's hallmarked 1826, so it's nearly 200 years old, this watch. Um, so I guess it has every right to be a little bit worn. Um, and it's pretty old fashioned really for its time, even for its time. I mean, you've just got two hands there, no, no seconds um, on, uh, on show. Um, it's a plain flat white enamel dial. Um, uh, the bezel is uh, hinged at the top at 12. You can see there's a little thumb piece down by the six to help you open that up because you would need to do that to set the um, set the hands on the central square. Um, uh, you know, each time it ran down or it went out of uh, uh, out of sync. Um, the case maker is one of two people, the hallmarks uh, a JD, and looking in the uh, in Philip Priestley's books, uh, 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 his um, amazing amount of research, um, there are two sort of incused JD marks, and I've not been able to distinguish whether there's a difference between them. So this case was made either by a chap called James Dow of uh, 54 Percival Street in Clerkenwell, or Joseph Dewin of 35 Charlotte Street, City Road. So either way, it was made. Uh, the case was made, you know, in the city Clerkenwell vicinity. Um, the unusual thing about this case, which is quite difficult to see, um, and I'm afraid I've not got a better close-up of it uh, here, but is that the way that the front lid is sprung, because um, almost all Hunter watches, or any watch with a with a opening lid, um, there's a spring sort of within the band of the case, which then pushes against the, uh, the hinge, sort of very close to the hinge, uh, been sort of from underneath so you have a sort of a, 
uh, the hinge, you can't see the spring, it just sort of um, curls out from the in inside the case. And they were known as secret springs to a large extent because of, I think because they were quite well hidden. Whereas this case actually has a pair of springs mounted in the lid of the case. And you can just, if you look at where the hinge is and just above you can see the top, uh, there's a little pin just sort of bridging across. Um, and that, that pushes against the, uh, the band of the case when you, when you close the lid uh, and springs it open when you open it. So there should be two there. Uh, when I got this watch, the bottom spring was cracked uh, and the top one was completely broken. So I've made a new one for the top, um, replaced that, and it does pop the lid open slightly. And I've left the original one there just for the sake of it uh, for the time being. Um, and I've only seen this in one other case. I've always sort of keep an eye out. Um, and I found another watch, uh, I was on eBay, I think, with the same case maker's mark in that had this type of springing, and that's the only other one I've ever seen. Um, so it was obviously his own idea, possibly improving um, sort of dust, uh, dust proofness of the watch. Um, so if you go on to the next one, uh, open the back of the case, that's just done manually, sort of with a thumb piece on the edge of the case to, to, to open that up and uh, key wound in through the back dome. Um, there's a fairly traditional sort of small engine turns band around where the key goes in. Um, and uh, the dome, yeah, the, on this sort of era of case, this inner dome is, is part of the case, it's a solid bit. That's not hinged or doesn't open at all. And you quite often see people who might have some familiarity with later pocket watches who don't know how to get the movement out of these uh, and you get these inner domes horrendously sort of mangled around the edges of people trying to open them up. I've even seen them with holes in and all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, seems daft to try that hard that you that you sort of damaged something so much. You can see the inside of the back is quite, um, quite hammered. It was quite dented when I got it and I've uh, uh, hammered it out so it looks right on the outside but if I were to smooth all of that on the inside it would remove the hallmarks and things and uh, you know and thin it too much so um, that, that inner surface I've left I've left as is. Um, if you go on to the next slide and Chris so that just shows with the, the two covers closed and you can see that the central band on this is um, it's very thin very narrow and both uh, covers front and back are on the same hinge um this style of case i'm i believe is what is known as a concealer case where you've got the one hinge for both both covers front and back and you get with an open face case as well um not necessarily just with a hunter case um uh, what it means is that you can only the two covers can only be about 90 degrees apart so if you open the front you can't really open the back without the front then closing um which i guess may be a disadvantage i mean very soon you you've got um cases where you've got a much thicker band and um and each cover is individually hinged um but you can see it's quite a nice sort of lenticular i think might be the nice word for it form of the case it's sort of slipping in and out of pocket quite well um, next slide then um, and we move on to the movement. So the Barold name goes back to the 1770s and um, uh, we have a past master of the clockmakers company here. We, uh, uh, Paul Philip Barold was master of the clockmakers company uh, in 1810 and 1811. Um, so you know this this is a, a firm or a, a business and a, a family dynasty really with um, quite high up in the uh, echelons of horology in London in the early 19th century. Um, it's a verge movement so again partly why I picked this uh, today is just to have something that wasn't um, uh, wasn't a lever or you know and, and uh, have something with some age. So for 1826 it's quite uh, you know it's quite old-fashioned certainly in technological terms as well just to, to be a verge um, a verge escapement. Um, uh, there's a few things that are sort of uh, pick it out as being a, a barrel. They, they had this particular style of movement that tends to get known as an all brass movement because um, you've got a gilt brass balance. Um, the regulator arm you can see coming out is also brass. Um, those two parts were often steel um, or you know and the regulators are often blue so it's quite a plain sort of mono color image really other than the blued screw and the balance cock and the, uh, the jewel setting the, the, uh, for the balance. Um, it is traditional being a verge, but it's a fairly, uh, it, it's a well-made one. The, both pivots, top and bottom of the verge are, are jeweled, not just the one that you can see on show here. Um, so, it, and it is a, you know, it's a nicely finished movement. Um, so it's got four jewels. That top one certainly is a sapphire looking at its color, um, not, not a diamond end stone. 
so this is kind of a, a medium to upper range watch, you know, verge watch from Barold, um, but probably for your traditional buyer who wanted the solidity of, of a verge rather than a newfangled lever, even though by the sort of the second half of the 1820s, the lever escapement watches were, were fairly common. Um, the plates, you can see are pinned together, no screws holding it together, just those taper pins. Uh, if you move on to the next one, Chris, and sort of a side view in, uh, you can see the fusee, which is half wound with the chain going around it. Um, and also indicative of a verge escapement, the, um, uh, the contrate wheel with the teeth that's sort of sticking up um, uh, on so end. We've had a couple of questions about, uh, <clears throat> about the, um, about the movement. Could you explain what a verge is to um, to, to um, So a ver the verge was the, is the oldest um, type of mechanical timepiece escapement. I think is the uh, I think is correct to say, um, and it's rather difficult to get into the uh, whole uh, whole uh, technical description of it really. But you have um, you have a staff. It, it, you have a staff with two flags on it, which are about 90 to 100 degrees apart. And um, the escape wheel, as it ticks through, pushes a flag out the way. Um, it's, uh, it's a recoil escapement, which means that it also, when the balance has gone beyond the center position, it actually pushes the movement backwards momentarily. Um, and that's what enables it to keep going. And it was the only escapement that could work without a balance spring. So this is, as an escapement, it's been around since the 13th century, if not before. Um, uh, and in watches, certainly from the early days of watches and before the balance spring was invented, um, all watches were verges. Um, so, so we're looking for, in order, in order to identify a, um, a verge, we're looking at that piece on the left. Are we there? The, yeah, so that, that, little, that contract wheel will generally... Yeah, would generally in, indicate that something was a was a uh, was a verge escapement. Um, I mean, there is the next um, the next slide is a video of it running, um, although we don't know whether it might be a bit not um, sort of notchy. Um, let's, see what, let's see what happens. Let's see what yeah, happens. Yeah, we can try. Um, because if you're used to seeing a you know a relatively modern watch or even a an even a nineteenth century lever watch going. Um, it looks pretty uh, jumpy to me, but what, what what you may may not be able to see, or probably be able to look at again afterwards, that this um, the balance is only vibrating in a total of about 120 degrees. So from the midpoint, it does about 60 degrees in either direction, which is pretty good for a respectable for a verge. But if you compare that to a certainly a modern wristwatch that would be when it's flat, sort of 300 degrees or more in each direction, and this this um, I mean, it's one of the reasons why uh more modern escapements uh, were uh, and those which allowed the balance to swing to a greater degree were better timekeepers because you had yeah. a um you had more uh more movement more vibration which was less likely to get disturbed and disrupted as it um as it moved brian in the audience noticed uh, the dial is beautiful is it all original the dial is all yes yeah all original yeah dial, uh, dial is yeah just uh, white enamel that's that's all original okay. Um, so it's not, you know, it, it's it's quite an old, to say, an old tech watch, really, for its even for its date. English, there, there were English verges made up right to the end of the nineteenth century, incredibly, presumably for very old-fashioned people um, uh, who wanted a, an old verge, you know. But they were pretty well discarded by any quality maker not long after this, really. Um, they would have been making duplex escapements and cylinder escapements and lever escapements more more likely than any other by the 1830s, um, 1840s. So, um, yeah, and then one final slide, I think, um, of uh, two watches together. Um, reason being that, so the barrel on the left and the one on the right is signed um, Harris. This is a chap called Clement Harris. Um, and it's also hallmarked for 1826. And Harris's shop was a few doors down the road of Cornhill in in the city um, from Barrowd. So I just uh, I've ended up with these two watches that might well might have been sat in a on their shop respective shop windows on the same day, and someone could have walked past Harris and gone, "No, I want a hunter watch from Barrowd," and walked in and bought the other one. Come the next one. Um, yeah. And it's just sort of you know a, a coincidence. I've ended up with these two, um, you know, that that would have been only a hundred yards apart or less than that even. You know, nearly two hundred years ago, when they were they, when they were bought. So, um, yeah. So okay. that's that's it. Uh, the, well, the Harris, just to say, is a lever and is a you know seconds and everything. Um, 
uh, yeah, and that, I think that's about it, really. So a, a question from me, Seth, um, yeah. that's hopefully not too daft. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, yeah. no more daft than all of my wristwatch questions that I send you on. It's fair, it's fair. Um, so you mentioned that, that, that um, other, other movement types would have, uh, would have come later, so um, cylinder escapements and lever yeah. escapements. Are, are they typically much more accurate than, than a verge, or are they more robust? What, what would be the reason for that, that progression? Um, yeah, accuracy would be the the reason um, generally for the, the the problem with a verge and an uh, and a cylinder and a duplex is that they're all frictional rest. So you've you've always got um, something rubbing against the balance as the balance is swinging to and fro. And the great advantage of the lever is that it's um, uh, it's a detached escapement, uh, and so the balance is free of that friction for most of its uh, swing. Um, so uh you you're you know it, it, the friction is the enemy of of uh, of the timekeeper essentially um and um and that's why lever watches would have become much better having said that that might this barrel does run a minute a day like reg, you know reliably um which is not bad really um and with a watch without a second hand isn't as good as you're gonna need or want really yeah that's um, pretty good going so it's good uh, so at the beginning we mentioned you're a quest scholar yeah um and you're a case maker so yeah. what what's what's happening with quest then so quest is that the next slide there's a little description it's uh, almost like we prepared for this almost almost as though chris sort of uh, yeah got me out of so uh so quest as it says in front of you hopefully um is a uh, well it's the charitable arm of the royal warrant holders association so that's all companies businesses that supply the royal household um, uh, you know, by appointment to the Queen and, uh, and things are um, are uh, warrant holders. Um, and Quest is uh, a branch of them that support craftspeople of all ages, um, all backgrounds, um, in order to sustain and improve British craftsmanship. Um, so they they essentially help fund training um, through various ways, um, either through you know uh, specific courses or apprentices or as in my case through one-on-one uh, -on -one training with uh, with someone so when i heard about crest quest and what they did i i had to think about what would i like to um what would i like to learn about and already having been making cases for a few years um i'd always been interested in engine turning and wanted to do that and that was what i ended up presenting to quest as an idea and was fortunately successful in my application um so i um uh i'm currently still in the process of uh, of learning the art of engine turning um in order to decorate watch cases as they were um uh, from a, a a british craftsman who's pretty much the only kind of freelance engine turner if you like i think left um who's been doing it since his apprenticeship in the early 80s i think or late 70s um all he's done is engine turning so he's pretty experienced uh, i don't think there's i could be learning from uh, anyone better um uh and on top of that i'll also be doing um a bit of uh spending a bit of time with uh Brittany cox and um uh, hopefully we'll be coming over here at some point once i've uh, um, got my machine all, all sorted out and uh, uh to help me out as well so um you know to be learning from two sort of uh, you know experienced or uh, uh, engine turners is uh, um very valuable you know it's sort of something that's not um uh, you know, money can't buy kind of situation, really. Um, so, yeah, so Quest are, are, are funding that training. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, the, the, so the pattern that was that was almost on the back of that pocket watch that you showed yeah. us a moment ago, that was engine turning? Yeah, so that was engine turned, um, and that was the traditional barleycorn pattern, if you like, that is on most, uh, most pocket watches or when you see a pocket watch engine turned. Um, so engine turning was a decorative art, really, really that came in for metal finishing quite quite early but big, i think was popularized in the in the sort of second half of the 18th century um and uh fabergé eggs were a, a particular sort of um uh you know, where they're particularly well known from uh, but also breguet was a great sort of proponent of it um uh, and it also looks fabulous under clear enameling so it was very you know you get some fabulous watches with um or uh, you know other objects which are engine turned and then enameled um to give really a, a amazing finish um sort of style 
Should we look at some examples of your craftsmanship? Perhaps? Yes, we can. <laughs> can <almost. laughs> if Here you happen go. to have any to hand. Oh, just just happen to. Yeah. So this is a this is a, a test piece, if you like, I, I did with um with Steve, who, who's training me. Um, uh, I mean, in the in a style of a of a dial, if you like, with three sub dials, um, which are not evenly spaced, because part of the exercise was in order to recenter back over them after doing the barley corn background. Um, and then turn the, uh, the sort of the concentric rings in, in the sub dial pieces. Um, so this was done on his machine in his workshop, which is a, a plant machine, British uh, machine made in Birmingham in the middle 20th century, um, which was um, a fairly common trade machine, if you like, at the time. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much the most complex thing that I've done so far um, under his um, guidance. Um, as I say, the various various situations, moving workshop of my own and uh, and all kinds of things have sort of dragged out my training to some extent. And obviously the current situation has made it impossible as well, but um, hopefully later in the year we'll be able to get back on, uh, uh, get back on with it. So the, I've got, I've got one more picture, which yeah. I'm, I'm slightly, I'm even more fascinated. I, I love this stuff. I love seeing your work, but here's one more, which um, I think might melt a few minds at home potentially. Um, so, how many different finishes are going on here? Well, so that, I mean, that, that's a piece that I've done fairly recently or, you know, several weeks ago on, on, uh, on my machine, um, which again is a barley corn pattern in the center, but there was a, a rosette that I hadn't tried, um, which I sort of started on just to see what it would do really. Uh, and that's sort of that, that sort of funny step, step outside border. Um, so there's some con a couple of concentric circles, then there's, about five rows, I think, of that pattern, and then a couple of concentric circles, a little gap, and then concentric circles again before uh, before the barley corn. Um, so uh, yeah, so this this is sort of just a, a practice really to get my hand back in after a bit of a break, um, just to have a go at, uh, at creating something. And is it so a, this a rose engine? Brass. These are that you use. Is that right? Sorry, is it a rose engine? Yes, it's a rose engine, which, yeah. which we might have a picture of. We may, you may have there a we go. Of. So there we go. That, that's so. This rose engine was um, constructed over a period of about twenty years by a chap um, who uh, I was very fortunate to borrow it from, basically at the beginning of last year, and then a couple of months ago he actually gave me the option to buy it from him, uh, which I obviously jumped at. Um, it's made up some parts which he made specifically for it um the rose roses for instance are all um uh, a custom made for it the bed is mahogany which he had, he had got for it but then there are other parts the cross slide is um is a plant one so the same type as the one that uh, steve my my teacher has got which is quite good because that's the bit you, you handle mostly so it's a it's a great looking machine because it's in the style of sort of a late 19th century machine really um but with some more modern elements to it um, and uh, I've got some work to do on it really to make it really suit my purpose. Um, that barley corn in that last disc that we just looked at, that's as fine as I can do with the current set of rosettes. So I need to, so I need to make some new, uh, new rosettes that will, that will, um, that will go finer uh, to Goodness. do finer patterns, which is what I really want to be able to do to do really, you know, nice, nice finishes on, on good quality cases. Fantastic. Um, so there have been a couple of things uh, said on the on the chat, which are quite interesting. Um, Chris from <clears throat> Canada said he thinks there's only about twenty people still still engine turning globally. Um, I'm surprised it's that few. I get it when you go on the internet. Professionally, you know, people, professionally, oh, professionally think, yes, it's yeah. professionally, yes, that's probably the case. I mean, I, yeah. I I think in the UK when I've sort of thought about it there's only a few that do it as part of their work, I think, part of their business. Yeah. So you've got um, Roger Smith, it's Josh, obviously. And it's Josh Shapiro, isn't Yeah, it, you've got States, Josh Shapiro so. in the States. And, yeah. But also in, in the UK, you've got Yard of Laird in Birmingham, uh, who are in the same building as the Struthers, uh, I think, who uh, make pens and they, they do straight line, in, straight line turning mostly, it uses a slightly different machine. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I sort of struggle to think of anyone else. Steve, it's Steve Roland, is a, I think Roland Murphy from RGM watches. Still yeah. Does some as well. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Thanks, there, there's well. very, very few, um, uh, very few professional engine turners who only, who only do it. Certainly. Cool. Um, I think Steve who's teaching me is that I think that it's the only person in this country whose sole activity is engine turning. And there was one more question from Kevin. 
a question about, actually i think this is more a question about materials than anything else okay. um, if you had to make a silver case for a pocket watch would yeah. you use english or german silver and for what reason uh i use sterling silver um german silver is usually the name given to nickel silver so that's not actually silver um so i always use either silver or gold obviously depending on what client um wants um I, i'm you know i make cases bespoke essentially for you know one at a time um everyone is different um and uh yeah so it's uh, they're either either silver or gold and then hallmarked in um uh, in london uh, the goldsmiths um pool um thank you um and then Greg, Greg's pointed out that Kari Vitalainen um, oh, yes. and his team also make quite a few. Yeah, well, you've got, dials, obviously you've got Swiss, but, yeah, yeah, Swiss firms, uh, yeah. both independents and the big firms. I think some of the big firms have got, you know, rows of um, uh, rows engines or you know engine turning machines yeah. um, and uh, other things to do. Yeah, yeah. but uh, certainly a, uh, one that's dying out and probably on the red list of, uh, of our endangered. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Endangered arts and crafts in the UK. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. All right. No, pleasure. I hope that was all right. It was great. Should we have a look at yours, Matt? Your watch? My, uh, you can look at my watch, or if you want me to get my engine <laughs> no, out, I could do no. that too. Oh, no. <laughs> Over <Okay>. to you. <laughs> so um, this sits somewhere between um, Seth's, which is the earlier watch, and Jonathan's, which is slightly later. It's um, probably the first half of the 19th century. It's French, not English, and I'm usually... It's not a lever uh, or a verge. It is a um, it's an, uh, a cylinder escapement. So it's another type of escapement. So we've got three for the price of, of one today. So this uh, slide, next slide. Um, there have been a couple of questions about enamel dials uh, in the in the Q and A and why they look so good after 150, 170 years. And it's because enamel is a, a fantastically inert substance and and can um, Kind of keep that beautiful uh, whiteness and that luster um, for for a long length of time. Um, however, you can see in mind that there are some some scratches. And if we go to the next slide, although this is a relatively simple simple watch, you can see that there's some some quite nice big um, uh, cracks actually running running through this dial. Um, because enamel dials are fired on a on a single piece of metal, if there's any bending or torsion of that, you can quite easily crack them. Or anything hitting the dials, you can uh, can crack them too. And this one's obviously suffered. And if you look at the screw at three o'clock, that breguet number three, you can see probably someone's done a little bit of over tightening and managed to crack it as well. So so not particularly good, but, but there we are. So French classic breguet esque numerals. Um, this um has a has a, a slightly interesting feature and if we go to the next slide um so this is probably you know the, the first half of the of the 19th century um it's 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 not breguet quality um or loire or anything like that it's a you know it's a pretty stand in a boche probably um that's the uh, the brass um uh, of the uh, of the ruby uh, sorry of the um cylinder scheme and you can see um but uh, you might just notice that there are a couple of um a couple of uh, uh kind of tubes running around the outside and if we go into the next slide that's because it says two hammers and is a quarter repeater so there's a large um silvered hammer uh, at uh, one o'clock in that picture and just about two thirty, three o'clock you see a smaller hammer um the central square peg in the, in, in the center is for, is for setting the time and the, the barrel is off to the left hand side so it had two keyholes one for uh, winding it up one for setting the hands um, so how does it how does it work you know there's no slider there's no button um, well it plunges so the top um, the top just pushes down and um, literally just pushes down and uh, and is released and, and then it tells you the time to the nearest 15 minutes so it's it's quite a nice way you can it, you know, it's, it's slightly less complicated I think than a slide um, slightly simpler but um, used by a couple of English or quite a few English manufacturers as makers as well as the French but a nice little thing and hopefully the next picture might be it in action oh no all right so this is it running fast obviously uh we can move on quickly um uh, hopefully this will um so i couldn't hear anything then i couldn't hear either 
Did anyone hear anything? So that was 11.45-ish, um, sometime before midnight. Um, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a fun thing. Uh, relatively, relatively low tech, relatively cheap, uh, quite cheerful. Um, can we just run it one more time? If everyone can just be quiet and yeah. we'll run it one more time. Yeah, so I've just realized this video was taken uh, before it got serviced. So you can see that the, the, the big and the, the small hammer isn't, aren't quite working as they should. But um, yeah, so um, any questions? Uh, can you please have it straight on that one? Um, what, what you might, I don't know whether you'd know, Matt, but that watch probably has a few Z chain in it, a very short one, which is what operates the uh, repeat mechanism. Up to that dial. top, yeah, up to the top bit, so that you can yeah. see the um, fast and slow screw at twelve o'clock in that video as well uh, for altering the um, the speed of the um, of the strike. Yeah, um, yeah, I haven't taken it apart. I, I, I obviously give it to to other people. Have, to... have a short little fusee chain that runs around um, a pulley, basically, to then that pulls against and winds up the barrel. Are, they, are these a fairly uncommon thing? Striking pocket watches, quarter repeaters. Uh, no, I think quarter probably the most common of any repeating pocket watch, um, uh, or half quarter. But um, it's a fairly straightforward thing compared to a minute repeater. But as in, would this be something that's like you've got your standard pocket watch that say I may own, and then someone who is slightly better off than me, has a bit more money to spend, would be into watches that chime. There's like sort of orders of, it, it's a more expensive thing to buy, I guess is what I'm getting at. Probably. When they were new. Oh yes, when they were new, definitely, yeah. Yeah, so more complicated, not as many watchmakers making them, perhaps? A question for the knowledgeable people about watchmakers in this group? Well, the, I think they were made to fairly standard patterns. You know, there were some, um, Swiss certainly makers who made sort of standard repeating, you know, abortions essentially. Um, uh, so you do see yeah. them. Um, so if you look at the shape of um, uh, shape of the, the piece um, between the two the two hammers, that's quite um, it's quite easy to spot in French. Uh, similar French um, aboches. Um, that bit kind of looks the same, but interestingly, the, the where the escapement is within the watch kind of seems to move around a little bit, uh, depending depending on on how early or late they are through the through the nineteenth century. So, so I think whoever created this aboche did some work on it over a series of time, because I've seen quite a few that have, um, have, uh, have looked pretty similar. Um, James has asked whether we can play it again. This is James from New York. Can we do one more time? We can have a go. Um, let's see what happens. I think Matt said beforehand he will probably put this on his Instagram later in the week or a video of this later in the week. So make sure you're following Matt. What, what is your Instagram handle, please, Matt, for everybody at home? Matt, who is on mute? <laughs> is it in the chat? Okay. Um, okay, I'll play this again. Let me know if you can hear it. Oh. And there we are. Thank you very much. Any more questions from anybody? No more questions. Thank no you. No more questions. Okay. So, what, so that's three pocket watches. Chris, what have you brought to this uh, virtual get together? Um, potentially a pocket watch. Mine is a bit different than the other pocket watches in that it's broken, um, which is a running theme with watches that I buy. Uh, I like to buy broken watches. Um, typically, it means that someone hasn't touched them for a very long time and they've been stuffed in a drawer and they haven't been messed around with too much. Um, I don't know if that's the case with this one, we'll see. It, it doesn't run, um, I'm assuming it has a broken uh, mainspring, but we shall see. So this is um, a Louis Branton Sons Labrador. So if, if Louis Brant sounds like a familiar name, he is the chap that founded the company that later became uh, Omega. 
um, and this is one of their first, I think it's serialized production run movements. Um, so they started making these in 1885, they made them up to about 1905. Um, this is, th there's no branding on the dial of this, the movement is labelled as Labrador, and in taking pictures of it today, I discovered that uh, under the um, regulator, under the swan neck regulator adjuster, is the word Omega. So it implies to me this is one of the last of the Labrador pocket watches before they fully switched over to everything being um, branded as Omega. It has a, um, I think it's, an, is it 19 Ling line? L-I-N-G-E? Line. Line, 19 line movement. Um, in A Journey Through Time, this movement is pictured as chronometer grade. I don't know if it is. There's, there's very little information that I've been able to find about these. It's not listed in the, in the Omega movements and there's, I think, 15, 15, 16 variations of the 19 line movement all the way through chronographs and all sorts of interesting things. Um, I bought this again from the bottom of eBay, where I buy many things, um, as broken. Um, it was filthy. Uh, the dial was not white. I didn't take pictures beforehand, um, but it had this uh, lovely black film of grease all over it, which I very carefully removed um, with a cotton swab and a little tiny amount of water and being very, very gentle. Um, and this lovely dial was underneath. So it's, it's a, an enamel dial, it's got a, a slightly recessed sub-seconds, uh, they're blued steel hands, uh, Roman numerals, and um, let's have a quick look. So there's the dial with, with the glass out of the way. Um, it, this opens, um, sort of, the, both parts open fully, so you can open this thing out, both parts, both pieces of the case at 90 degrees, it's got a really thick band on it. Um, it's hallmarked as 935 silver, um, which, uh, if you visit the website that Jonathan mentioned earlier, which I will put a link in the notes to because it is really interesting and David's got a lot of really good research on there, talks about this being um, potentially a misunderstanding between the uh, English government or the English assay office and the Swiss. Um, and the, the Swiss thought there was some confusion about 925, 935, so they added in more, just make it more. Um, and this watch has got a little bit of engine turning on the back of it, um, sort of centre medallion piece, which I've seen a few similar style watches customised with initials. Um, this one is just sort of worn down around the edges and you can see a few dents and marks. The, the silver that covers the, the end of the pins for the hinges have worn away on one end. So this has been a well used up until the point where it stopped working. Um, there's a Labrador mark on the case back. It, it's very, very similar to the style that Omega use on their pocket watches. The case numbering is very similar. Um, it, if you were to try and align that to the way Omega um, numbered their cases, it, it's probably about 1903-ish. Um, it has three bears as the, as the hallmark, which tells you this was um, exported after 1887 um, into the UK specifically. Three bears mean it, mean it came to the UK. Um, you will occasionally see eBay sellers saying that Labrador was an Omega brand that was sold specifically to the US market. That's not true, that's just made up. Um, cases that went to the US only had one bear on them. Um, and nearly, I think every single case that was destined for the UK market had the three. I found a, a, doc, a piece of documentation um, from a Swiss court session uh, of the of watchmakers talking about changing to one bear for the UK market and the argument was made that the, the UK had got very used to three bears and if you took two of them away they would be confused. So the, the Swiss knew that we were easily confused and stuck with the same symbology um, and that, that hung around I think 1907 might be the end of that, that type of hallmarking. Um, but yeah so it has Labrador brand, it's, it's a full um, silver case, 935 silver, um, and this is the movement. So it says Labrador registered trademark across the top. Uh, it is 15 joules. Um, it's quite a nice quality pocket watch movement. And this is one of the reasons I bought it. I, I was sort of aware there have been these brands before Omega and I, being that's what I collect in, in wristwatches typically, I sort of keep an eye out for pocket watches. And I saw this and noticed that it had um, screwed chatons, which are the, the little pieces you can see that the jewels are in and those are gold. Um, I noticed that the um, the regulator on it was sort of quite nice, although this one is a little bit dirty and got a few marks on it. I thought this this feels like a, a better bit of kit than I would normally expect to find at the bottom of eBay for 50 quid. And yet that's where it was and that's what it cost. Um, it is going to cost considerably more than that to get it fixed, but I think it's worth it. I, I like preserving 
bits of horological history if I can um, and this sort of is, is older than anything else I have and I, I just really like it. Um, here is the thing I discovered today, the, the Omega underneath um, the Swan Net Regulator. I had not spotted this before and it wasn't until I was peddling around today with good lenses and proper cameras um, that, that I found it. Uh, it's stamped as Swiss on the movement plate. This is the later version of these particular type of movements. The very, very early ones have got the top plate as, a, as, as I think it's referred to as a three quarter plate where it covers three quarters of the of the top of the movement space is all one piece. Um, I read somewhere that they stopped doing that because they weren't very good. Um, I suspect it was just probably a bit easier to put together two pieces and if you have any sort of alignment issues they can be overcome. Um, and I think that might be it. Any questions? Anything from anybody? Any glaring errors anyone would like to point out? <laughs> Bill, Bill, Bill from the US, um, so it's a classic Omega caliber layout, uh, thinks it's B grade of the, uh, of the four kind of uh, Omega grades. I, I said I'd give you an A minus, but he's giving me a B, uh, which seems I, I, a bit harsh. I think you're right, Bill, to be honest. Um, the, in in the, the sort of slightly later Omega versions of this, because they kept making this movement, they just put their own, they put a different name on it. They managed to establish that brand as, as, as better. Um, they've, been, they've been selling well. In the Omega 19 line calibers, there are lots of different grades. And the very, very top ones, which I think are chronometer and railroad, they have a jewel in the center. Um, there, there's, there's better finishing. The regulator is, is um, it looks, much better finished in the line drawings that are in there. Um, I think this is probably quite a good pocket watch from the time. I don't think it's the top end of what the Swiss were making. Um, it, Bill, Bill is nodding vigorously on the chat. Yeah, I, 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 I've, I've sort of got to the point where I've looked at a lot of these in trying not to buy total rubbish. <laughs> so, well, so, and that's a good point. So that's a really good point. So perhaps for Seth and Jonathan, actually, a question's come in about resources for researching English or Swiss pocket watches. Are there uh, some good websites, books um, that we could we could tell people to go to? I mean, Alan Shenton's book, The 19th Century Pocket Watch, I think is a is a fantastic book. Um, and in fact, uh, it, on, I think on page 334, um, you'll find the Marconi version of the of the the telegraph watch um, and it's got a full range american watches english watches swiss watches all the different escapements right the way through so from in terms of the 19th century which covers an awful lot of watches um, it's a really good uh, it's, a, it's a really good resource i think yeah well and obviously we have to say you're supposed to join the ahs as well and get access to that big um, online library of documentation absolutely yeah, you've got absolutely. all the bhi journals and yeah, just i quite i quite like this one yes that's also a really great book yeah because it has I mean, lovely photos in it lovely photos it's all really high end i suppose the uh, the other book the shenton book is has got kind of all all sorts um isn't necessarily all like the high end stuff um uh Yes, and then that's. Oh, that's Cl and then Daniels, Daniels isn't yeah, bad. Daniels it's, I mean, again, high end, but you know, I am quite high end. Yeah, boy, <laughs> aim high. <laughs> Plus, George Daniels, you know, so you get extra points for that. Yeah. So, if, um, if people mention it's by Daniels, it doubles in price. So, try and get the one that just says Clapton on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, as far as my kind of research into the, the very specific brand stuff of this, there is there is a great big book that was made by. Um, I think it's called, uh, Bill is about to create, but I think Marco Ricon at Omega, um, who was the, he was in charge of museum and heritage. And um, there's a book published by Omega called A Journey Through Time. Um, it covers a lot of the pocket watches, clocks, but it also covers the, the sister brands and the previous brands and has a section about this thick just on pocket watches. Um, because I think a lot of people that like wristwatches um, may not be fully aware of just how many of the companies that are successful now and exist still now started off making pocket watches. Um, uh, there's, there's some really, really interesting stuff in the histories of brands you would find on the high street now. And they might have changed ownership and there might be sort of all sorts of different things going on. Um, but a lot of, the, a lot of the, the big brands that have managed to keep up heritage departments 
can help you with information. Um, as, for me, like a lot of the stuff as it gets into the 1920s and maybe the movements are not quite as interesting um, from a horology perspective, um, you start to get into sort of fascinating cases and techniques of overlaying metals and there's just some like beautiful art deco stuff that exists. Um, but yeah, lots of good resources out there. But I mean, I mean Seth and Matt, both bench of the HS. Um, I know a few of us were talking earlier in the week about the resources that exist there if you are a member. Um, and there's, is it all of the AHS journals, the BHI journals and the engineer? Is that right? Engineer, there was Probably. some other... Um, there's something else. That, yeah, I can't, there was some, there's an early 20th century magazine or journal or something, I think. Um, I can't remember what it is now. Yeah. So, well, and, and, and the wonderful thing is, it's, it's, fu it's, it's fully searchable. So, incredible resource. Yeah. Uh, James James Nye has pointed out it's watch and clockmaker from the years 1928 to 1939. Um, but then you've got 150 years of the BHI's journal and uh, every single um, journal from the horological and sorry, antiquarian horological society as well. So, all for the flat fee of 60 odd quid or whatever it is nowadays. Amazing. Yeah. To, to add to what Chris, you were just saying that, I mean, one of the fascinating things or uh, great things, if someone is interested in the technical side of watches, you know, and may only really be into wristwatches, is that you can see so much more and you get such a great variety when you go back through history. Um, if you look through the 19th century, in particular, or, you know, and then back even into the 18th century, the variety of mechanisms and escapements and complications and all sorts is you've got so many years worth of progress and of different people's ideas you know post post office watch i guess is a is a perfect example of that you know something just sort of out of left field as it were that's um you know uh, and it's so accessible in terms of you can see it much very easily as well uh, in pocket watch size um, yeah i think that's a big thing that appeals to me and wristwatches it can be quite hard to see and you sometimes need special tools to open them but a pocket watch you can kind of use the edge of your fingernail and open it up and you can see this movement you ticking yeah. away um and th these are like they're generally a lot cheaper than wristwatches so i know i know there's a lot of collectors out there with bottomless budgets i don't think any of us are those collectors um uh or, or horologists um and you can find these sort of really fascinating little pieces of horological history um and it, uh, you know I, I love especially yeah. things some of the stuff you work on seth that is you know hundreds of years old with, with sort of interesting complications and it's, it's just it, it's fascinating it's lovely to hold these things in your hand isn't it like and sort of imagine where they might have been and who might have made them yeah absolutely and they're decent sizes as well most of these pocket watches i mean uh, it's not just that you can see them but you can see all of them i mean they are you know, yeah good sizes yeah it, it, not tiny <laughs> just we big hands <laughs> no, right. any, so, any more uh bill bill is talking about um uh hamilton elgin railroad grade watches and there was a q a question i think from james as well yes absolutely um there's a lot of that us stuff that chris mentioned with the damaskining um beautiful uh work on the uh, on the wheels mm -hmm. and the and the plates um and richard stennings mentioned pritchard uh Cathy pritchard swiss timepiece makers 1775 to 1975 uh for two centuries there of swiss timepiece making so it's pretty cool look out for it i have been making oh, this one so is seth <laughs> looking, showing a bit of uh damaskining maybe or yeah something yeah. Um, I, 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 I've been making notes about these books as you mentioned them, so I will I will add these two show notes and put them on on the website with links to where you can get them from. Hopefully, as long as I manage to spell them right. Um, any more questions from the panel? Anything that's, from the Q and A or the chat? I think that's it. I mean, I mean, the 50, 50 or people um, uh, talking about pocket watches um, is pretty cool actually for a Sunday night. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. thank you so much thank you thank you to uh to as always to my wonderful co-host matt thank you to jonathan and seth for joining us um thank you to the 50 plus people that have come along and listened to us all talk about pocket watches and not left that's very kind of you um it's not the reception any of us normally get <laughs> um and um matt, matt and i have been working uh, this week to get some more wonderful guests lined up so we have at least three more three more of these sunday afternoon sessions um in the plan um so we we'd love to see you again so please do join us next time thank you to everyone for uh, for your involvement whether on the panel or at home drinking a beer and asking us questions um and have a great week thanks everybody thank you thank you, Chris. Thank you. Bye.